I'm Olivia Clementine, and this is Love and Liberation. Today our guest is Oceana Sawyer. Oceana is an end-of-life doula, writes and speaks on the liminal space of active dying and grief. She is currently researching and holding space in the realm of embodied grieving in a context of somatic abolitionism. Drawing upon her meditation practices, experiences as a sensuality educator, earth-based spirituality, and an intensive study in the expressive arts and integral counseling psychology, she brings a grounded, compassionate presence to her work with individuals and groups. You wrote a book recently titled Life, Death, Grief, and the Possibility of Pleasure. And I'm delighted that we'll be traversing these grounds in particular today. Looking forward to this conversation too with you around um, all things pleasurable in an area of life that most people don't find. You know, it seems very dissonant actually to be talking about pleasure when you're talking about death and dying. And I, this is, this is, these are places where I, I kind of geek out. So I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> you know, you talk about how we're in a growth and a growth culture that's at odds with the nature of reality, essentially that, you know, there's impermanence, that life is dynamic, that essentially we're embodied seasons. And at the same time, we're also in a culture of consumption and encouraging our nervous system to further remain on these kind of like stressful hold patterns of wanting to possess, uh, only allowing ourselves to really receive life once we've gotten the things, whatever it is, the things that we want. Yet pleasure from what you share doesn't seem to be this kind of culture. And I'm this culture of uh, being at odds with the nature of reality. And I'm wanting to know from you, what, what does pleasure include? And what are some of our misunderstandings on pleasure? Well, actually, <laughs> pleasure could include those things you just mentioned. Um, if that is a way that you are finding um, accomplishment um, and there's joy in that, uh, then there's, you know, I'm not going to, you know, yuck your yum, you know, that's, that's righteous. Um, and then there could be other ways to find pleasure as well. See, here's the, here's the thing about it, right? And this is where people, uh, I think, tend to get tripped up on this whole conversation around pleasure, which is they think it's a thing. They think it's this thing you do outside of Rhine culture. You know, it's this thing you do outside of, you know, white supremacist capitalism, you know, but not necessarily because pleasure is not dependent on circumstances, time, place, things, people. They're at all. Pleasure is simply, uh, it's in fact, entirely an inside job so you create pleasure with your 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 capacity to conceptualize to, and to make judgment about your world so that's just all you so if you have a job that's kind of a grind and you find maybe a way well, first of all, you could find that pleasurable. Like it's it's better than the alternative in your world, which could be, you know, being um, on the street without housing, um, which depending on where you are, that could actually be up. But, you know, um, the you have an alternative that is less, that feels less good to you than what you're actually doing. And that's fine. What I'm suggesting is that you could find a way even in a circumstance like that, to expand your experience of how good it can feel. So a lot of people have a very low threshold of what's going to feel good. It doesn't feel bad, so it's good, you know. So that's good. I mean, that's actually not a bad place to start. You're out of pain. 
you're not suffering um, too much. Um, you have your basic needs met. That's actually a good place to start. You should do all those things. And then on top of that, you could look for ways to expand how an experience could feel. And this is the important part here. Feel to you even better. So you are the arbiter of that. And, you know, it's just simply what you want to put your attention on with any of your six senses, right? Sight, sound, taste, touch, hearing, um, and your ability to think thoughts. I probably dropped one out. But, you know, you any of those sensory portals can be opportunities for you to put your attention in there and just notice what you notice. And if there's something in any of those directions that feels good, you could actually just deliberately put your attention there for even just a few moments. And here's the secret sauce, approve. Like, let yourself know, you know, this feels actually pretty good. You know, you're walking to the bus stop on your way to work and the sun's out. You could actually just notice the sunlight on the buildings or the trees or the sidewalk or people's faces. And that one moment, you lean into that, you claim that, you own that, like, wow, that is really, really pretty good. I mean, like, practically spectacular. And, and you might even find yourself giggling. I'm, You're giggling. I'm giggling. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, yeah. And so that's a moment that you approved of in, of some aspect of your world. And that's pleasure. That counts. That's enough. You could have more of it from there or not. It just depends on what would feel good to you. Pleasure isn't like a, a luxury item, right? <laughs> Sometimes people ask me, oh, Shiana, how does this pleasure apply to, you know, people who don't have access, access, you know. And I know when people, especially when people in European bodies start talking to me about access, I know it's code for, you know, everybody who's not white. And I especially want people in black and brown bodies to know, queer, transgender bodies to know that this book is as much for us because there's so much in the environment, in the field that would have us feel otherwise. So to do like almost an about face, I'm like an Aikido move and say, yeah, no, 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 <laughs> you're not still in my joy today. And just again, for a moment, put your attention on something that actually feels good to you. This is how you resource yourself. This is how you get fuel to go on. And now I'm just going to move on to how this is so important for death in a dying process. Because, you know, again, people think that if someone is dying, then this is now the moment where, you know, you have a hall pass, I guess, to feel terrible, <laughs> sad, and, you know, sorrowful, and you know, and, and, and you can do all those things. I, I'm not even saying any of those things are wrong or bad. Um, and it, it could be that indulging in sorrow feels good to you. Like it's giving you the reality that, yes, I'm having a moment in life now that is important as weight. So you should feel those things. And it, there could be other experiences that you can also have, including that. So I'm never about in this conversation around pleasure, like stop doing that thing that is harming yourself or harming other people or is bad or wrong or, in, you know, that's not my thing. Um, my thing is do the things, do, do your things. Chances are anything that you are actually doing right now feels good enough to you because you're doing it. If it didn't feel good enough, you wouldn't be doing it. You know, people don't tend outside of some extraordinary circumstances, and I know those exist, but outside of extraordinary circumstances, most people are not um, intentionally trying to 
um, harm themselves. That's a nuanced conversation. I realize that, but just for the sake of the conversation, we'll just go this this direction. You're mostly you're doing things. Even I will say though, in a self harming situation, people are choosing that activity because it somehow soothes them. So it, the alternative is still better. What they they may be cutting on themselves, um, but it's still better than feeling whatever that the the trauma response is that they're having so that's all of that you know is is fair so anyway the point is is that even in really hard times i want to say that whatever you're doing is right mm-hmm. just to start there whatever you're doing is already right for no other reason than you are actually doing it and you yourself are a right person because you exist. The universe created you. And so you are therefore worthy of goodness. And you are, you're right. You're a right person. There's nothing wrong about you. So we're going to start there. And from there, you can see if there's something you want to add into your experience that would have whatever you're experiencing feel even better. Now, in the context of grief, <laughs> this is now this is this is a really fun part, right? Um, because you know, people think, oh, you know, it's so hard. I'm crying all the time. I'm just, I'm just a mess. I'm crying all the time, and you know, I, I, how do I, you know, this, this can't be right. This can't be good. You know, I'm losing my friends. I'm practically lost my job. And in that case, I would say, well, maybe what might feel even better is that you cry more, cry harder, cry louder, cry with, uh, try adding in waving your arms while you cry, beat the floor or the pillow while you cry. Um, You know, you can add in some music to your cry fest go for it, you know? Um, And that's, again, another way to have something feel even better because I know that when I'm experiencing a grief wave, this trying to hold it back might have the temporary, temporary, you know, experience of, okay, well, I'm keeping it together. I'm not embarrassing myself in public. But the alternative could also feel good and maybe even better, which is just let it go. Neither way is right or wrong. One way could feel better than the other. You won't know until you maybe try it. You know, give it a shot. I say experiment. I'm really big into experimenting when it comes to pleasure because often people don't really even know what feels good to them. We're so not conditioned around pleasure. You know, we live in a society that, um, well, if you live in the United States, you live in this society that was founded by, um, you know, the United States government was founded by, you know, Puritans or, you know. um, So we have a lot of um, conditioning in our culture around suffering, sacrifice, you know, and that's fine. And there's some other stuff you could add on. <laughs> like you could, um, you know, add on some, some, some laughter, some movement, some joy. So, yeah. Did I answer your question at all? You totally did. And there's so many parts I'd like to go back to that you shared in that beautiful introduction. And I, I really appreciate actually also the fact that you started with righteousness, like, you know, not being righteous, and then that everybody is right, like you kind of like did this full circle. And um, yeah, I really appreciate you kind of pulling the mind out of the rut of right and wrong and needing to become another way. And I also just am curious, before we continue down this road, you have this phrase called uh, responsible hedonism. And I wanted to see if you'd also just elaborate, like what would what would you deem as responsible attunements towards pleasure versus irresponsible, just kind of laying more groundwork for this realm? 
Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> so good. It's, it's important. Um, the central tenet to responsible hedonism is that your pleasure does not cause harm for someone else. So that's the basic of it. You're not causing harm to other people. Your pleasure doesn't come at the expense of someone else. Now that's just a baseline, really what should be happening in the ultimate practice of responsible hedonism is that your pleasure spills over onto someone else and they are also pleasured because you are. I love that because whenever I think of liberation, that's kind of the essence of it. It's this not being so self obsessed that something you're able to gift the world in who you are in a way and in some way it feels like there's a parallel of inhabiting one's pleasure is is a pathway of of freedom and and this kind of more boundless generosity oh my god i couldn't have said it better myself you know that's 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 sort of the um again a kind of one of the maybe Aikido moves in 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 the, on the path of pleasure is that people think that they have to give to everybody else, make sure everybody else feels good before they can feel good, before they can you know do self care or whatever. And it's actually the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's you being um, gratified, um, you in a in a state of feeling your best, feeling really good. That is the state from which you can actually give people um, anything that feels good, anything at all. So it's not like you're going to be, this is especially true for caregivers, by the way, who are working with people who are, are, are dying. You know, there's a lot of sacrifice, self-sacrifice in that position. And there's a lot of condition, conditionality around that. We even reward people. Oh my gosh, they're being such a hero. You know, they haven't eaten in days because, you know, and we we glorify that when actually caregivers could actually be more effective if they took time to fill themselves up, to have a good meal, to, you know, while they're sitting bedside with somebody not just drinking water or whatever they can find in the kitchen, but, you know, making sure they have maybe even their favorite beverage, you know, so that even the experience of caretaking starts to feel good. There's elements in it that feel good. And from there, in that state, in that, you know, you could almost call it in that state of pleasure, in that state of grace, in that state of, you know, there's more spaciousness. You feel more expansive, more becomes available, more creativity, more generativity becomes available. So now you're sitting bedside and you can start to open yourself up and notice what more is available here. You know, now you have potentially an opportunity to get into the realm of spirit or consciousness because you're physically and mentally and emotionally cared for, gratified. And now you can see the, 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 the magic and the mystery that's also available in dying. Uh, and that's true for the person dying as well. And, and then again, that's how your pleasure, your gratification, spills out into the people around you. So even as a caregiver, now you're in the best possible state to be actually caring for someone in the most tender time of their life. You know, dying is hard um, and it's glorious. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, you know, I want to get out of these binaries there's so much more to pretty much everything than good or bad or they're living or, and now they're not. And, you know, I say people are living all the way up until they are, their body is no longer functioning. They took that last breath and now they're not living. I don't want to pathologize death or, you know, um, but 
death is simply an end point and then you're living all the way up until that so all of that living has the opportunity every moment of that living has the opportunity for pleasure for something that could be add delight or joy to the journey and what do you say i can imagine a listener like well what do you do when you're in pain and your body is in that dissolution process where where is the pleasure in that experience there isn't any pleasure in pain <laughs> oh i'm in quite a lot of pain myself actually i have a uh, autoimmune disorder and um i experience quite a lot of discomfort in my body and i can tell you that um having observed it that dying is uh very painful physically painful that's why you know the morphine is so important in all the, the painkillers the comfort care um because you want people to be out of as much pain as possible and still it's going to be painful. So what do you do? There's a couple of things, right? One is you could actually lean in to that experience, like dive deep into it. Like, why is this so painful? What is making this so painful? You could actually befriend it, get to know it and see if there's something in that pain that could actually uh, teach, show, tell, comfort, provide you with a, like an aha. And that aha is like now a moment of delight. Like, oh, I didn't see that before. Like, for instance, I was uh, walking the other day. This is actually an example of going the another direction, which is you don't deny your pain. But you could add on something that feels good. So I was walking my dog uh, last month, and it was pretty hot here. And uh, my um, arthritis was in was in full flare up, and it was kind of a challenge. And I decided to um, walk a little slower because that felt better, so that eased the pain a little bit. But then I started looking around my world. You know, and all of a sudden I noticed, oh, you know, I never noticed those wildflowers before on the side of the road. They're actually quite nice. And it's almost like on cue, the universe said, oh, you're noticing us? Well, okay, let me add a breeze. <laughs> you know, oh, now there's a breeze floating through. Oh, this is great. You know, these trees are pretty cool. Um, so my experience of the pain was less. Was my actual, you know, was the pain actually less? Probably not. But my experience of it was less because I had added in something else that was delightful to me. And that, again, that could only be for a few moments. You know, it doesn't, it's not going to take the pain away entirely. It's not going to take the pain away um, indefinitely. But for a few moments, you have your attention on something else. And again, as I said, that few moments is resource. That gives you enough kind of like fuel, enough like uh, resilience. You could keep walking. You know, you could keep dying. You could go on. You could find something um, meaningful, possibly even in, in the circumstance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've talked about the dharma of of pleasure and just in what you're sharing right now, I'm hearing the the need to discipline oneself and devote oneself to the pleasure practice because it's so easy to, like pain is such a strong sensation. So it can be easy to be a servant to it like at all moments, right? Because you really have to retrain the mind and body to look for something else, another possibility in those moments. And I'm also hearing those qualities of non-attachment, like, okay, well, I, you know, I looked, I saw the, the, the flowers and I felt the breeze and it only lasts a few moments and the, your appreciation towards that, not necessarily needing it to be longer, like allowing it to be a short experience of pleasure. And it's really profound to hear because I think for many of us, we want 
the permanent pleasure. We want to have it just come to us and no effort needed, even though like there's an effortless part in the process itself, but it really does take this commitment to, from what I'm hearing and my own personal experience of being a human, a, a, a commitment to to turn in, in that direction. And I'm thinking of a listener that's really struggling in how do I come out of the ruts, right? Of being more of a servant to pain rather than somebody who's open to something better in, in the moment, right? Something that feels uh, in the sensory fields more nourishing. And I love the way you, you brought in the use of the word Dharma because I, I often talk about it like that. Um, the, uh, a path of pleasure is like a Dharma practice you it takes it does take discipline it's um it's easier to access if you've been in practice so um you know on that walk it was very easy for me just to turn my attention to something else that looked and felt better to me because i am in practice I can do that, you know, at, at will. Um, and I often do. So that's why I tell people um, that to pursue it like a meditation practice, to devote time, to devote um, space in your day every morning. What are you going? I know a lot of people have gratitude practices. That's actually a good place to start. Um, every morning you could look for something that feels good to you using any of your senses and just spend five minutes with that in that practice or or longer and then have a closure to it and then go on with the rest of your day and see how that affects the rest of your day. You know, because it could be now that your day started out on a on a different note and now you're kind of cruising. And when you have that inevitable dip, because that's life, right? You're going to be in and out of consciousness. You're going to be in and out of pain. You're going to be in and out of suffering, in and out of joy, in and out of wonder. That is what you want. That's living. So the practice then becomes how to be more in the spaces that feel good to you and less in the spaces that don't. And that's not to say those spaces don't, that spaces that are painful and hard are wrong. I think, and you probably know more about this. Yeah, I'm sure you know more about this than I do. I've been listening to Pema Chodron and Alice Walker talk about Tonglen, you know, and I just think that is like, yes, that is the right way. Because, you know, inside suffering is this deep well of resource. It's this, this sort of like place you get at the bottom of it all that um, you can find a way to come out. So, for instance, if you're listening to this and and you're just really feeling like you're in a, a rut around suffering, like this is like this has gone on a long, long time, and I have I can see no way of getting out of this rut I'm in, this depression, this you know sadness, um, anger, or whatever is feeling uncomfortable to you emotionally, and. I would say like 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 a like a uh, a meditation practice lean in explore it this is where you want to just kind of like have some curiosity and really own that like what is that why does that feel so bad and um go deep because in that depth is most likely the answer to like how you, you know, the, the, the way you're going to bounce. You know, I grew up with a pool 
And the first thing I always did in our pool is I jumped, I dove in the deep end, you know, well, that's me. So I'm going to dive in the deep end. And I always, the first thing I always wanted to do was go straight to the bottom of the pool where the drain is and then touch, you know, get my foot, you know, turn, turn around and touch off with my foot and push myself back up to the surface. I would do that every single time. And I always felt like it was such an accomplishment. Getting to the deep, getting to the bottom of the pool, there was always this sort of drama. Will I make it in one breath? It, it, will I run out of air? Will I drown? You know, and But I would always get to the bottom and I would could turn around and use my foot to push myself back. I found something hard, something solid to push myself back up. As a kid, I found that if I actually turned around and started trying to swim back up, it seemed to take longer. Whereas if I just kept going, got to the bottom, I knew I could use the momentum of my my muscles and my legs to kick me back up, push me back up, the surface helping me, like springboarding me back up faster than if I just sort of turned around and tried to like um, paddle my way back up. So that's what I say to people who are um, really in deep grief spirals. By the way, I just want to say here, I am not a therapist. So if you, you should do all the things that you do to manage your um, uh, your process, your journey, whatever that is, you know, uh, therapy or um, whatever that is for you. But another way I'm suggesting another possibility is to go even deeper. Get curious. See, here's another um, interesting concept, which is the things that we tend to feel ownership of are the things that we that have less control of us so we the things you have ownership you, you can claim ownership of anything cuz it's you it's just you and your world and your perceptions to perceive it and judge it so you can claim ownership of anything and that claiming of ownership then opens up pathways of creativity okay well yeah this is pretty pathetic i am here on the sofa i've been on the sofa now for about five days and i think i've i've watched every episode of you know whatever netflix i'm, I'm you know binge watching um and um and I'm, and, you know, I, I'm still, I'm still here. And so then the opportunity is that, well, this is my state and I, I somehow gotten myself here. How did I get here? How did this become like my everyday existing? So now you're getting curious. And in this curiosity, you might find um, some other answers, some other way. Um, you could reverse engineer it even. Okay, well, this happened and this happened and this happened for me to arrive here. So if I did this other thing and this other thing and this other thing, that might be a way out. Or you could simply find there, like I often do in meditation, wisdom from some other place <laughs> that I would have never thought of, never imagined, comes in and goes, oh, yeah. I could have done that or I could be doing this or this is happening because like just the other day I was taking a <laughs> I was actually taking a, a pleasure course which was um not very well taught and um it was painful actually mm -hmm. and uh I emerged from that halfway through that experience just really like wow this is I'm, this is bad. I, I'm, I'm not gonna, no, I, I don't think I can do this. And so I decided to call the instructor and, and, or text the instructor and let them know I wasn't going to be coming back and you guys are just fine. And, you know, I need to be doing something else. Um, so, and, and that, that worked out. 
but even ending my experience in that course, it became activation for some other older material within me. So now I was actually having a, a, a really pretty significant grief spiral. And at the bottom of it, I just let myself cry, 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 harder, louder. And for me, what I heard was certainly the ancestors were like, I know this is pretty bad, but hey, good on you. You got out and now, you know, you don't have to go back to that particular community ever again. Like, you know, it was a learning. And so even just that aha moment was like, oh, okay, yeah. And, you know, and from there, you can just see other ways that how you can take care of yourself in the future when you're in those situations. And, and you know, the resilience is being, you know, built moment by moment there. But yeah. Yeah, I like that sweetness that kind of like, don't be so hard on yourself that you chose to sign up for that and you never have to go back. I mean, there's so much in there. I'm wondering too, as you share, what, what do you feel like are some suggestions if somebody's in a, a swirl of grief and feels overwhelmed, feels overwhelmed by all of the things that can come up, the anger, the fear, the in that process, what is what have you noticed that's benefited you or benefited people you've worked with? Generally, when I'm working with people, I let them sort of be with. Often, when I hear people talking about spaces that they're in that they can't seem to get out of, the narrative that I'm hearing is a lot of story about all the things that they've done to get out of it avoid it, paste over it. And I, in my practice, have tended to direct people back to into it. Now, I don't recommend you do this alone. If you haven't done it before, you might want to get a buddy or a friend, someone you trust. I mean, I do it with clients. And I would not recommend them to do that without me or someone else. But what, get a friend. or it could, and, and your friend could be um, a kin in nature, in the more than human world that you have resonance with or kinship with. And spend time, you know, like this tree outside my window certainly is kin, you know. I would be with the tree and just lean in. And you know, you go as far as you can go and you don't have to go any further than you feel comfortable going and just stay hanging out at the edge. You go in and you hang at the edge of where you can go and just be there. It's so tempting to give people, you know, the five tips, the seven steps. And honestly, all there really is that I can see is to be with and breathe. Yeah. And that not only is it, it's actually possibly the most effortless thing to do. It requires the least amount of effort and it's the most expansive you know, because you've turned off the noise of all the how to's and five steps. And now you're just with, and the being with, um, again, opens up this realm of curiosity. And I think there's something really magic about curiosity. Um, it sort of, um, opens up the field and the territory. You start, you can go places that you weren't able to go before. And so, yeah, just be with, be curious and try to keep an open mind. I say this a lot. You know, you don't know, and it can be where this can go if you if you are just being curious with an open mind. And it's very tempting to get excited about the first aha. 
But I would suggest even with that first hit, it was like, oh, stay. Stay a little longer and see what the next hit could be. Maybe that first hit opens up. Or maybe there's that. And then behind that, there's something else that you didn't expect. So this this capacity to just stay a little longer, to stay with the edge and just breathe and be. And remember that, you know, of course, you are a right person and everything that's happening is right. And um, you can just hang a little, hang a little bit. You'd be surprised. This, by the way, is another secret of, of pleasure. <laughs> People tend to want to get off the train. Oh, rush. And uh, that's fine. You can do that because, you know, we're not very skilled at pleasure. But um, if you stay a little longer, it opens up or it could open up. And then you might find something even more. And you breathe you relax, you hang a little longer, and then something else unfolds. It it can be this actual, actually never ending unfolding. And then you say, okay, I'm tired of this now. <laughs> I want to have a sandwich, you know? <laughs> um, and that's fine. You know, it's, it's all about choice and conscious choice always. And it's all good. Oh, I hate that phrase. I say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I backtracking a moment. I felt really good just hearing you share that. My whole body felt a lot more relaxed and spacious at the possibility of going in those unfoldings and giving time to it. And the the one thing of this is right. The experience of rightness when something is really not right. Because you've mentioned it twice and it's made an impression on my mind around this is what's happening right now. So it's right. Not necessarily that it's like morally right or that kind of right. Yes. You you have to take the morality out of it. Um, and this is not, um, you know, this is honestly, this is like an advanced concept. So mm -hmm. it's not for the, you know, the faint of heart here because um and it's not a mind game. It's just literally a recognition that there are sort of levels of understanding um, or levels that various levels that are at play. So um, at one level, and this is not a hierarchy, but at one level, everything that exists that is happening is happening because the the you could say that the the universe or spirit god has created it so the fact that it is actually happening does mean that there is some um will to have it exist so it is that it, that it exists is is means that it is supposed it is happening okay so that's right that's just at that level that's just you know now The actual act of police-sanctioned violence against bodies that are deemed less than human by the social order, that violence, that act of violence is morally repugnant. That's, we're not even talking about right or wrong there. It's just morally repugnant. It's it's wrong. I, you could call it that. See, the thing about the binaries is tough um, because, you know, I think of Viktor Frankl, who was the, the, the fellow of Jewish heritage who, who um, made it through the... Nazi concentration camps with his soul not just intact but somehow expanded um, 
And he then, you know, has gone around the world with his very particular philosophy around the possibility or the act of finding God, pleasure, joy in any kind of circumstance. That's, you know, his particular, him, that that reality that he's had that. So we know that even in the most horrific experiences, are opportunities for um, expansion, some leap of um, consciousness, delight, maturity, And it might not be in that moment. That's the other thing is people tend to want to make immediate judgments about a thing, what about its moral goodness or rightness. But when you get to be 60, like I am, you start to see that there's actually a longer arc. And things can look one way in one moment. And then in a hundred minutes, it'll look different. In a hundred days, it'll look more different still. And in a hundred weeks, it'll really look different. So it's, again, it's, it's um, my approach to these hard moments are kind of the spaciousness of like, there's, you know, that of time. You know, again, back to the levels and the the multiverse, right? (laughs) There's all kinds of things happening on all kinds of levels. And um, I know that you've had Bio on this show, and he talks a lot about how the Middle Passage um, became this way that the the Yoruba gods, Yoruba gods, exported African bodies around the world and created culture all over the planet. They're the most, African people have become the most um, transitory, the most migratory, they're the most dispersed, there we go, across the globe of any group of people. Um, Now, obviously it would have been preferable if um, they had chosen their excursions. But, you know, here's another thing I've been thinking about is, you know, again, in the, in the vein of um, brother bio is what did that create? Like, what did that generate for, and I can think about it very specifically because I am myself a descendant of someone who was on that ship of someone who survived the middle passage, the horror of that to only to arrive on a shore amongst people they had never seen before. Lots of them in these almost translucent bodies, like, whoa. Um, And then to have to, have to, have to hang on so tightly to a sense of humanity. And then if you're going to hang on to your humanity, that's going to include sorrow and joy. And as Alice Walker says, furious dancing, you know, it's going to include all those things in order for you to make it, to pass on to the next generation, this sense of humanity and aliveness and creativity that is in inherent in my people, you know, the people. So that journey has crafted in on one level, a kind of a person who can metabolize and endure horrific circumstances. And still find a way to even use those circumstances for even more joy and life. 
that's like, who does that? Who has that capacity? You know, so that amount of depth, that sort of pressurized creation of almost diamond-like quality of humanity and aliveness, you know, regardless, is how else would you get that? Yes, of course we want it. We we don't want suffering. We don't want people to be killed and um, tortured and mutilated um, as they have been. Of course we don't want that. But it is. And so given that it is so, what would you create with that? Because this is like the almost like the law of the universe, right? The, it will, you, there will be creativity. There will be some, there will be life generated out of um, the stuff. So that's, that's just going to happen and it is happening and it will continue to happen. And the ways that it happened are how the universe creates itself how it creates more life more generativity bigger better wider more uh with more capacity so you know oh, okay i'm not going to go down a cosmological road I, I, like, I, please do if you want if human beings are the product of hundreds of billions of years you know of the universe creating itself then all there has already been all the different ways that beings, living organisms have been um, created and and destroyed, created and destroyed. So destruction is a part of it. And so how you navigate that though, I feel like there's so much, fractal generativity happening right now and i know a lot of people think it's it's so much it's so fast it's so vast and there's you know concepts like attention you know warfare or you know a, a attention you know resting your attention away because there's just so much so much so much but um it's also true that you could dive as i said before even deeper into any one of those, you know, multitude of things that's gen being generated, you could, because you have the capacity, human beings have the capacity for self-reflection. The universe created human beings out of all the living beings with this capacity for self-reflection. Brian Swim says the universe created human beings so that it could have a way, the universe could have a way to reflect upon itself. We are that. And so given that capacity, a moment in time like the slave trade is a blip. But what comes out of the slave trade is the creation itself, is the universe itself. And so you could really just now in present time, I would say for my, to myself, lean into this like, wow, I have within my DNA all of that learning of the universe that you know tried and failed and then succeeded all of that history is here and I could reflect back on that and that's good because there's some learning there but then what do I do with it going forward how do I take in a way that's sort of like what you would do with the legacy of all that trauma is you would actually take it 
and then use it as fuel to create something with that has more life because that is actually the the you know the way of the universe to create itself you would just use that and create more life so that's why personally i don't like to spend a lot of time in like social reform uh, i don't really care i think somebody should be doing it i do that's really true people should be doing that honestly i feel like people who created the system should be doing that that's you know their work to do the people who are on the receiving end of it are you know in the in in the project of re you recovering using that information like oh that happened and now what do we do with that going forward and the going forward is i feel like the universe presenting us with an opportunity to create something new especially right now right where so much is collapsing mm -hmm. i mean why would you reform you know the u.s social system <laughs> it's kind of collapsing you know uh, the you know the, the so many thousands tens of thousands of species are dying like daily you know it's just incredible we're in a extinction moment okay so that's that's happening and so then what would you create to make your way through it and wait for it <laughs> wait for it this is where i feel like pleasure comes in it's like this is how the universe creates itself it looks to see what it's attracted to you know it uses allurement to use a, a, you know brian swim um language you know what are you attracted to and that is how it you know brings elements into itself to transmute you know bring together and adhere and create something else so i feel like this is the moment that we're in as human beings who are able to consciously self you know be consciously self-aware to um yeah use all of that spacious creation possibility to create something new something more more life to go on and i feel like well, if I can say this, I feel like there are certain kinds of people right now who have, well, actually, let me put it this way. Every kind of person has a very particular, you know, piece of the puzzle right now. And I don't feel like we're at the moment where we can be all one. I actually feel the opposite. Like everybody should actually concentrate more, like focus in more on like, what has my what is my particular group of people what's special about that what is now our superpower that we can like hone and um use to move us forward which of course would move the entire human project forward that's where i see the generativity is and and nothing not like any other people are wrong or bad again now we're back to you know nobody's wrong or bad you know even you could say the trumpsters there's something in there that they're trying to work out that much is clear i'm interested honestly on the level of what is it that you're trying to work out over there i mean for real that's a whole other subject but but you know, to be to be focused inward to what is it that we are working out here? What what are people who are African descended in the United States working out? What's their spot? What are people who are two spirit or trans working out? What is it that they're generating? What are they creating? I just want to say side note here. I really all of the social thought 
that people who locate themselves in the trans uh, world have put out to the rest of us in terms of how we can imagine ourselves in terms of gender, the, the way that that got exploded open by their life force energy to claim that and just really that broke it open for all of us i have been walking around the world thinking of myself as a woman just like all the way up until a couple of, like last year now all of a sudden i'm like you know i don't think so i'm i'm kind of a person and I'm way more expansive than this one lo lo locus of identity. I don't need to be this other identity, just that. I can, I'm just going to be out here in the, you know, center, big expanse of it all, the big expanse of it all. And so that's a great example of a group of people who just really dug in and focused and generated out of their own experience and location this way of viewing gender that's now expansive for everybody and i just feel like there's so much opportunity for that you know people again of the african diaspora who have landed here in the u.s have that capacity too and you kind of and you can say you've already seen it you know in the music and the whatever art but there's even more there you know, um, there's more there for descendants of the Holocaust to dig into that and just really like locate that and pull out what wants to be come out of that. What's, you know, being generated. I'm sure there already is um, that happening. So, yeah, I think that these, you know, this is another aspect of cosmology, right? This idea of um centration you know we're all centers of every living thing is a, is a center of the universe on on one level and so the extent to which you can really like um own your center and recognize there are other centers that you're bumping up against and including and not including and that whole dance is you know i just think yeah, that opportunity for generativity is there. Really expansive hearing what you're sharing. And I'm so appreciating your ability to embody that just from this conversation. It feels like you're that you're the way your mind is able to perceive this cosmic reality versus the solidified woman reality or whatever it is, right? Um, mm -hmm. it's really beautiful. And I'm thinking of what you were sharing earlier, it's advanced to, to, to know the multiplicity of beingness and to inhabit it. And I'm curious if there's anything else you want to share, anything that feels really important to you in this moment, um, beyond all the amazing um, plethora of wisdom you've shared that you want to leave us with. The thing that makes the the path of life as it goes through its whole cycle you know it, and it winds down in death let's call it living life physical life as it winds down in in death the opportunity there to really stay with it to stay conscious all the way through um, is so important because there's like a, there's a portal that opens up near the end in active dying. It's, it's like a, and everybody who's, who's been there knows it's, there's a stillness that comes in and you almost feel like you're like a doorway got opened up to the other side and you're not going to go through it. And I will just say on one level, your physical body goes, whoa, look, we're not, we're not dying yet. Physical bodies and death is a whole other topic because bodies will do whatever it takes to take the next breath. 
honest to God, they will. But, you know, you, a portal, a portal opens up and now you're in this liminal space between living and dying. Uh, the person who is dying and everybody in the room who is with the person. Now you're on this journey together. You have been. And now your journey takes this very particular um, turn into the portal between living and dying, the liminal space there. And that is, in my experience, the most expansive base. Um, if you are paying attention. And again, this is why it's important to have a practice of opening into pleasure before you get to the end. Because in the end, then what you have is this muscle that you already have good practice with. And now you're available for this magic and mystery that happens at the end. Because there's something you can tell in the, with a person who's dying. Something, they kind of lift, they start to lift out of their body. And even the physical hardness is like the pain of it doesn't matter anymore. What there is now is this like lifting away from the body and you feel all this energy that comes into the room. And believe me, when I first experienced this, I thought, oh, that's not happening. Really? Like, no, it's just too cliche. But then I didn't have a better explanation. So I went with it. Okay. You're the family. Yes, we are the family. Okay, good. So, you know, you have all this energy that fills the room and you could call it um, the, the family, the ancestors who have gone before they come to be with every person I have been with who's dying, by the way, always reports they saw somebody who's already dead, was in the room, you know, last night or right now. Um, and um, and then you're in this this place where every, every all of life, it's like the um, it's like the edge effect, right? In a, in an ecosystem, everything's happening right there. All the people who've already died, the person who is actually dying, and then the people, the person, the people who are living, they're all right there. And if you're open, you can be in the conversation of all of that, right there. It's a it's telepathic for the most part. You know, you, you're not using your physical mouth, but it, you can have this experience of that. And then they, then the person actually dies and that energy kind of starts to diminish in the room of all the different, um, and then, but there's still the portal that's open. And this is another place of sacredness. The sacredness continues. And so you can, you, the person who's still living, I don't use the language of survivor. That's just like warfare. This is not what we're talking about. The people who are still living can then, if again, if you're conscious, you can still be in the portal. And there's so much happening in the portal still. It's a very spacious place. It's timeless. It's dimensionless. You know, you can you can grieve there. You can cry there. There's that's active mourning happening there. Um all the feelings, all the things, all the stories, all the memories, and all the possibility. All the possibility. What would you create from here with everything you have just gone through? This sacred moment of being human where it ends and now you're still here. What would you create? And so... That's where you can start to employ all your different tools, practices for living. Again, this doesn't have to be a big, big thing. It can just be so small, just so small. Take a walk and just notice something. Ah, oh, I remember that thing that they said about Aunt June. Yeah. And now suddenly that thing has even more import. You know, it has more weight. So that is is why I do the work I do because that that moment in a life cycle that almost that we have so much conditioning in our society 
to avoid, hide, spend as little time with as possible. We have language around it like creepy and, you know, that's just natural life. That's just, as I was talking before, the universe saying, okay, and we're done with that. And now we're going to create something else. Because, you know, the person now is just, all. only thing that happens is the person is done with their body. And their energy, their spirit, their kind, whatever you want to call that, is going, it continues. It's just in a different, you know, form now. But it's still going on. I still commune with my mother who died in 2019. And believe me, she's really expanded now. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, I just really want to um, just impart that these socially challenging moments of dying and grieving don't have to be that. Or they can be, and they can be some other things too. They can be so much more. Thank you so much. I'm I'm thinking of a phrase I, I heard you say where you said that when people are dying, they're more of themselves. And it's interesting that as I'm hearing you share about this preamble to the physical body in its final final moments. I'm thinking of all the moments that we're holding back in our life and we're holding back who we are, wearing all the different masks of identity. And I'm wondering through your journey of continuing to do these practices, have you found yourself being less controlled or less, um, yeah, held in, less holding to an identity? You were saying earlier, certainly (laughs) around the woman, right? identity but in other ways just like if there's if you notice more freedom in in how you express even the love right the love pouring through you um not feeling so um self-judged in a way yes i do i was actually before we we got together i was um thinking oh i hope i don't go too feral (laughs) because (laughs) that's such a great question because what everybody wants is to be fully self-expressed. And, you know, you certainly don't want to wait until you're dying to be fully self-expressed. You can, you know, you just get so little of it, you know, at, at that point. Um, or you get more of it, but it's concentrated in, in terms of time. But yeah, um, yes, that's one of the things, that's one of the um, ahas about being a death doula is that you you get so many opportunities to go, yeah, I think I'll be living my life now <laughs> because you really like, see how people get to the end and then it's just like, okay, that's over, you know. So you could actually be living right now. And and that's and that's really so true what you just said. Uh again, you know, also as you age, but you don't even have to wait till you're 60. You could just know right now all of those judgments or what you think people are judging you or your judgments about yourself those are going to be different tomorrow, you know, a hundred minutes from now, a hundred days from now, a hundred, you know, weeks from now. And so why not just like go for it, you know, just live all into it in your body, in your world, in your space. Like right now, I, I have had that experience of living more, more fully, more in my body, more in my life. Um, and not so concerned about what other people think about it. You know what I do now, by the way, I'm less interested in fitting into places and finding places that fit me. Like that course I was in, like, yeah, no, not my course. Um, And I've taken that course before. I've actually taught that course I was in and it's like, yeah, no, not, not anymore. Not, Not my place. So finding your place where you fit in and where you where you fit where you can feel expressed and you might grow out of that place and that's okay you'll find a new place because the universe is big the place you know the territory is vast